session of the LEAP program, and you may not have heard too much about it, but you might have seen the acronym. The acronym stands for Leadership Exchange Ambassadors Program, which is a international program. And we have five people here this this week who are from outside the U.S. and they are the selected candidates for this program for 2012. And what this program does is take people people who are Mensa members who are leaders in their own area, in their own country, their own national Mensa, and have them come to large gatherings like this and tell us how they do things in their country. Some, some things that we can, we here in America can learn about. And then uh, we exchange those in, that information and we are eventually going to have a website with an area that contains a lot of these programs so people can download them and use them whenever they, whenever they want to. So uh, let me just ask anybody here. I, I mean, I know there, there's going to be some hands go up when I, when I say LEAP, do you know what it means? But uh, how about the other people in the audience? How, how many of you, for you, it's a brand new term? Okay, well then we're going to teach you something today. <laughs> okay. Uh, Louise Steinkamp is here from Mensa, South Africa, and her program, her program is on social media, I believe, right? Yeah. Mensa's evolving social media approach, and that's the big, the big buzzwords today. So, okay, Louise, it's all yours. Cool, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very glad that you guys are all here. I really do love sharing, and it's very hard to share things if you don't have someone to share it with. So, thank you for attending. Really appreciate it. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. I think we be a careful time if we do start to spend too much time on questions, then I might just stop you and ask you to just continue afterwards. Um, right, uh, yes, like Alyssa said, I'll be talking today on social media and specifically the impact that it's had in South Africa on the implementations that we've done over the last year and a bit. Now, just to tell you a little bit about myself and my role in Mensa South Africa, um, I was myself quite frustrated with the lack of online collaboration tools and social media platforms that we had up until about two years ago in South Africa. We had a Facebook group and Facebook page which, which were working, um, but it was, it was a bit slow in that time. Um, our website was very outdated, it had very outdated information on it, it had incorrect information on it. If you tried phoning some of the numbers, they didn't work. If you tried emailing some of the people, it, they wouldn't get back to you because they wouldn't get the email for three weeks. It, it, it wasn't in a good state. Um, so I ended up spending more time collaborating online with members of Mensa in other countries, um, which was a little bit silly. I had access to Mensa in South Africa right on my doorstep, but I was spending time online um, collaborating with other people from other countries. So in September 2010, at our national gathering, when our committee said that um, you know, our membership growth had slowed down quite a bit, and they were a little bit worried and they knew that they had to do something different and they knew that there were a lot of initiatives individually within the regions but they felt they needed someone to coordinate all that effort. Uh, so they asked for a volunteer to act as PR coordinator and I put up my hand. Um, me personally, I'm very big on social networking. I'm a bit of a serial collector. I love connecting people and connecting with people. And I believe that there's never a single conversation or interaction, no matter how brief it might be, um, that's in plain. There's always some doors that open up somewhere, there's, there's always something um, waiting. So for me it was a logical choice. And then um, as soon as I got back home, I immediately started working on a PR strategy. Uh, and it was about three weeks from the IBD, which was in Auckland that year, and I decided that there was only one way that I would fast track myself in terms of where the rest of the world's mentors was with PR and marketing and all of the social tools and everything out there. And that was to go to the IBD and actually speak to everybody, and speak to people who were see what they were up to, see where they were, and see what we could do from South African perspective. So we got our, our draft PR strategy ready uh, within those three weeks, which I took with to the IBD, and I was fortunate enough to spend some time with people in workshops on marketing and PR. And from there, um, I was also, it was quite an enlightening experience because my perception as a South African was that we were way behind everybody else. And it wasn't the case. We were way behind um, some of the bigger mentors like America, obviously, um, and the British, 
British and such, but there were a lot of countries that were literally on the same page as us. They, they were also sitting, thinking that they had to do stuff, that they didn't show us how to do today. So we got to share our ICL strategy. Um, and to this day, that thing is still alive, and it's been a collaborative document shared between the countries. So that's been very good. Um, when I got back from New Zealand, um, with the help of some of the committee members and also some of the mentor members, who all of which just happen to be professionally in marketing and PR, we started implementing some of the things in our strategy. So I'm going to take you through some of those. Uh, simultaneously to all of this, there was also a survey done amongst our membership community because the, our national committee felt that they need to find out exactly what it was that members were expecting. Um, why was there a slowdown in, in our increase in membership? Uh, why was members not attending the monthly events? We've got um, four regions, a fifth one has just started up. Each one of them has a monthly meeting where we get speakers with interesting topics. Um, so, you know, why, why were people not attending these events? So they did a survey, a very comprehensive survey. And the, the amazing thing was over 70% of people actually responded and submitted their survey, which is phenomenal. I've never seen that in business. Um, which is also a good sign because it said that members were really wanting something. They weren't mad at Mensa, they didn't want to leave Mensa, they were just wanting more, they, they wanted something else. Um, so the general feeling, and this obviously is an exaggeration for events, but people were bored, they were sad, they were lonely, um, they felt that it had kind of defaulted to a society where they would have a meeting and have a few drinks and have a few parties and they could do that with their friends. They didn't need to belong to Mensa to do that. Um, even the ones that only, that, that for the majority really wanted to belong to Mensa for the social thing, still wanted Mensa as an organization to mean something and to stand for something in the community. Um, they wanted to be part of something bigger. So with the survey questionnaire feedback as well as our PR strategy and all the information that we gathered from the other Mensas around the world, we set up with a plan of action. Now this started about November, December 2010. So it's, it's about a year and a half ago that we started all of this. Now like I mentioned, we did have a Facebook group, which was a closed group, so you had to be a, um, a member in good standing to be a part of that group. But we've also got the, the Facebook page. So uh, people that just want information, the general population, they have access to all that information and can interact with Mensons. Um, so, so we kind of make sure that we keep those up to date. Uh, the website I'll speak about in a little bit. Uh, we implemented a new website that was one of the first things. Major, major change. Twitter, we opened a Twitter account and started tweeting. It was very slow in the uptake in the beginning, but um, we're now at a stage where the regions, the, the chairman and the testing coordinators, are actually telling people when they're coming for testing and they pass, they're giving them the, the Twitter details as well. And it's the most amazing thing because not only are people starting to tweet immediately once they've joined Mentor, but they're so excited, there's so much energy going. Plus, now this guy has just made it into Mensa and he's done that with six other people in the room and they're now his best buddies. So they're starting to tweet and retweet each other. So there's a lot of, um, you, you get a lot of traction um, that way. So that's really what top of. Our, our most precious Twitter moment was on the 29th of March, a minute before 10 this year, when we got the email saying that at Nelson Mandela is now following you on Twitter. That is fantastic. Now, um, yeah, now that at Nelson Mandela is not Madiba. Madiba's personal alias is Madiba, at Madiba. But the Nelson Mandela is his um, company that manages his foundation. And they're very involved in South Africa with Leeds, Leeds and other companies, organizations. They do a lot of work in South Africa. Leeds, for example, they'll do things like if they see that there are potholes in a certain stretch of road that the municipality is not getting to, they'll actually get people and they'll go, go fill up the potholes. If there's traffic lights out of order, they'll organize people to go and act as pointsmen, which is not always a good thing, they're not always good pointsmen, but the point is they do that stuff. So uh, it, it's really an honor to be followed by, by an awesome radio time. Um, YouTube, what we also started doing is previously we would publish videos, uh, radio interviews, that kind of thing as Windows, Windows media files on the website. But we changed that to publish it on YouTube simply because it's easier for people to find. People go to YouTube easily and they look for stuff, so now they can actually find it. And then we typically publish that on our blogger. 
Blogging is the one thing that's still very slow. And I think the reason for that is that it's not someone specifically taking care of our blogging. So we still got our forums, our Yahoo groups, all of those going on. Um, this one is very slow. This one is also not members only. This is open to the public. So we tend to be a little bit careful with what we put on there. We put, put stuff on there that we want people to react to and respond to more there. Um, and then LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been phenomenally successful. We also at the same time as Twitter created a LinkedIn group uh, but you also have to belong to me as a South African to belong to that group. And as we know, LinkedIn is more used for business, whereas Facebook is more the social side of things. But on LinkedIn, we've got about 65% of our members of Mesa South Africa in the LinkedIn group. Um, and they're very active. So what we're starting to see is that mentions are not only starting to interact more socially, but they're actually starting to interact more on a business level, which is fantastic. Obviously, a lot of those discussions are around the typical questions of do you put mints on your resume or um, can you stay in a job for more than three years and that kind of thing. So there is a lot of that, but there's also a lot of collaboration in terms of business. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the website now because the website is really the thing that for us has held everything together and that has bound everything together in one platform. Um, what we did with our website is we hosted with Yahoo. We use a lot of Google tools on our website, but Yahoo at the time was just much better in hosting. They were far superior to Google's hosting. However, it's very important for your website to use a lot of Google tools because Google's call list, which is the, the systems that use algorithms to find certain information on your website to put it higher or lower on search rankings, they actually check for things like how many Google tools you're using on your website. So we do use a lot of them. Uh, also, a lot of all of them are freely available for everyone, so it's a lot easier for people to collaborate and for information to flow through from other places to our website, which makes the website incredibly dynamic because the information keeps changing all the time. Every time you go on there, there's something is different, uh, but we don't have to physically sit and maintain. Right, so this is what our new website looks like. Um, it's very different to the previous one. Just going to go back for a second. What we did was we, um, and it's so funny because Vicky, uh, where's Vicky? There she is. Um, Vicky and Esther both, um, oh, not Vicky, sorry. <laughs> um, Alexandra and um, Esther, you guys both in, this morning in your presentations mentioned the competition for the website and the design and everything. And it was so funny because we actually had that in our PR strategy, is to run a competition for the design and then award some of that design. But before we could actually launch the competition, um, there was a company that volunteered to do the design for us. Now these guys, they do those funny things where they actually track with cameras and monitors and things where people's eyes look uh, to find certain information. So where they look on the screen, where they search first, where they search last, when it becomes too much information, all of that stuff. So we told them what was most important for us, for people to hear or to see, and they kind of gave us guidance in terms of where to put that. So that was also an interesting exercise. Um, so then on our website, uh, what we did was this graphic changes. This is just a screen dump, so obviously it's not going to change up here, but if you go to actual website, mensa.org.za, then um, it changes all the time. Um, so it changes about every 20 seconds. There's about seven to seven, eight different graphics. This countdown time is quite nice also because no, this was a screen dump done yesterday. Um, the countdown timer usually re relates to whatever announcement is on here. So in this case, it's the photo competition. And this will expire when the photo competition um, entries close. But sometimes we'll have a countdown to the next testing session or the next big event. Um, if we know that there's going to be a few weeks where we're not going to get to set a different countdown, then we just set it to we will enter 2013 in so many days, hours, minutes, and seconds. So that we know that thing will always be running and it will never be zero. Because that's the last thing we want people to go to the website and the information once again is old. Um, our members area at this stage, and, and I say at this stage because that's actually the next big project, at this stage it's really just a password control repository. So our members can log in there and they've got access to publications. But what we've also tried to do is we've tried to link our members back to the international community. It's important to us that they also understand that all part of a bigger organization. And yes, um, we are a localized membership community, but it's still part of a, of a bigger international organization and we want to encourage it. So what we've done on the members areas, for instance, um, things like the constitution, if you click on it, it goes through to the international side. So some of the things, if a member clicks through and they get to the international side for the first time, they'll actually have to register and get a username and password for that, which we also encourage, uh, because there they've got access to a whole bunch of other information. 
if they go to the shopping thing on our members area, we don't have our own online shopping thing, so that goes through to the shop, the Fox shopping area. The search, what we've done on the search, uh, and we did the same thing on the news, is we customized it to only look at Mensa stuff. So if someone types any kind of search in there, it looks at Mensa stuff, but not only South Africa. The problem that we have is because we're a fairly small Mensa, there's not that much going on. So you also don't want people to search for something and only find two results. And again, within seeing uh, international Mensa results, they also get exposure to what's happening out there. Uh, the how to join us was also a very interesting uh, exercise because what happened was uh, Mensa Netherlands actually, um, oh, there you are, yeah, you guys. <laughs> um, oh, there you are as well. Um, they developed an online test which people can do to, to kind of get a ballpark of, of where they fit in or, or if, how close they are to qualifying for Mensa or what their chances would be to qualify. Um, that test was developed two or three years ago. It was then taken by Mensa New Zealand and translated into English. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get permission of both those Mensas to use it on our, Mensa, our website as well. We implemented it last year and we immediately saw an increase in the number of um, test bookings that came through and the number of test inquiries. Immediately, you could, you could literally correlate the amount of people going through the online test with the increase in test bookings. So that was really good. Um, so there's three Mensas at least that are using exactly the same test. So we're getting the so uh, Events, that, what we did for events also, because events were, it was a nightmare before. People had these mailing lists and then they would send an email to whoever's on the mailing lists and those mailing lists weren't necessarily kept up to date. And of course if anything in your event changed, then people didn't necessarily get the notifications in time. So we created Google calendars for all the regions which means that the regions can go in, they can load their stuff on Google Calendar. It all feeds through to a single feed on our website, which I'll show you now. And as a member, you can log in and you can see all the events for your region, all the national events, um, all the testing that's taking place. You can see all of that in one place. But it does give the regions freedom to load their own things. If they don't have time, they can send it through to our central administrator. She's brilliant with that. And she watches that like a walk. If, if any events look like they're kind of going to run out within the next month or two, she gets on the case of the regional chairman until they give her information for future events so that there's always a long list. Um, and of course with Google it's very nice, with Google calendars, because people can sync it to the alpha calendars, to whatever other calendars they use. It's very open, very friendly. And also if you put your address in correctly, it gives you not only the map, but the directions to get there. And now, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I think about three weeks ago, Google also added traffic to the um, to the offering, so it's fantastic. Now you put in an address, you ask for directions. It doesn't only tell you the directions and how long it takes you to get there, but it incorporates traffic reports. So if it would usually take you 30 minutes, but now there's a traffic jam somewhere, and it's going to take you 40 minutes, it actually tells you. It's fantastic. It's like Tom Tom on your PC. Um, the blog which I mentioned is um, that's that's the one that we still need to pay some attention to. And then the news. The news I'll show you also screened up. What we did with that was also customize it for Mensa specific stuff. So what's nice for our members now is that they don't have to go and search all over the place to see what's going on in Mensa worldwide. They just go to our website, click on the news feed, and it's updated through RSS feeds from Google News um, with very specific filters so that it doesn't feed through too much junk. There's one of there about a, a DJ Mensa, but it's very few and far between of them that come through. Usually it's real Mensa stuff. So on today's feed, they've actually got three or, uh, two or three posts um, of the AG on there. Um, yeah, and then the normal contact us forms and stuff. Uh, this feeds through from the blog, so whatever the last blog update was um, will come through here automatically. The last one was an update of our Pretoria team and then had a radio interview. Oh, and then this feedback button. Now, I'm also a techie, so I get very excited about the techie stuff. This feedback button is a very techie thing, but also a very cool people thing. Because if people don't want to go into a specific form and click through three screens and fill in a whole lot of information, they can click on the feedback button, give us feedback about anything, website or an event or whatever, and click submit. The minute they send submit, that goes to a back-end system, which is an online system, but it's also a, um, 
uh, an online project collaboration and project management system based on Agile and Scrum methodologies, which means the minute that feedback comes through, you can prioritize it, make tasks out of it, assign it to people, and anyone in the committee can log in. It's all open, they can see exactly what's going on, what the feedback was, who's doing something about it. Alright, this is the events page that I spoke of. So people can click on either their individual region and they'll see the only the events. Um, or the gifted children, then they saw the gifted children events, and then of course the national one, which is the default one here. Now what we've also done is how to join us, there's also a link through to a testing calendar. Um, and that testing calendar only has testing information on. So this testing, I saw some testing on here, I think. Yeah, there we go. The testing will also be displayed on the testing calendar, but it doesn't have to be maintained in two places. It's maintained in one Google calendar, and it feeds through to different places. So the nice thing is, different people like to find information in different places, and this just helps you reach all those people more easily. This is the news feed that I spoke about. You can see this was today's stuff. This was about two hours ago. Oh, this calendar, by the way, says 7th of July, because my computer is still set to South African time, so we're on tomorrow already. In South Africa, it's a big joke. We always say that the Americans are so far ahead, they're behind. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this was today's newsfeed. We only limited it to a few. You can go further on the website and, and browse deep and whatever. But it just gives uh, some people log into the website and just click on the newsfeed in the morning to see what's going on and what's new and if there's anything that they need to pay attention to. All right, some of the results that we've gotten from all this, these online tools. Now, this to some of you might seem really boring, really mundane, because this is probably something that you guys have been doing for quite a, quite a long time in your mentors. Uh, we've been doing it a long time for business, but for us as South African Mensa, it had a huge impact. It was really exactly what the members were waiting for. So what we saw was firstly, for the first time ever in South African history, we grew our membership um, to over 1,000. I think we're on about 1,100 by now. Uh, and that was phenomenal. Not only did we grow over a thousand for the first time, but our percentage growth um, dramatically increased from the year or two before that. Uh, we now have an active online community and we've got increased income and queries because people now have access to information so the general public can now request more information because they know what questions to ask. Um, they've already filtered through the basic stuff that they need. So it also means that the queries that are coming through are typically more focused. So it's easier to respond to them. It's, it's less junk that's coming through. Real-time information is available and information is maintained by all the regions. So whether it's events, um, blog posts, anything, it's real-time information. And the nice thing for me, the nicest thing about the website is the fact that it's dynamic information without the need for a, an administrator to maintain it 24-7. Um, it all gets updated automatically. Obviously, it also mitigates some of your risks because if you only have one web administrator, you're in trouble if that's the person looking after your website. So, with different people having access to capture information in a way that they're comfortable with and it feeding through neatly to the website makes it easier. Uh, more remote members, this is a big thing that we saw with all the online stuff and especially the website, was that more remote members were tested and, of course, more younger members joined because the young guys are all online all the time. Um, they want to be able to access things on their mobile devices and on their iPads and on their laptops and everywhere. I know myself, I get very annoyed. If I want to know something, I want to know it now. And if I don't have a device with connectivity that can tell me what I want to know now, I get really annoyed. I want to throw a tantrum. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a great influx of media queries because obviously they also started seeing um, a whole lot of stuff happening in the but. The main thing here is the collaboration with other organizations. This has been tremendous. The biggest example that we had of this was last year, October, with the 65th birthday event. What we did in South Africa is we decided to focus the event on gifted children. So um, we hosted it at an IT company, and they actually quite big at doing community work and not only providing computers, but actually getting out in the communities and providing training and other things. So we hosted it there. Um, and what we did was we invited uh, Shirley Cockett, some of you might know of her. She was the founder of one of the biggest um, gifted schools in South Africa. And she's a speaker right around the world. She's released a couple of books. And, and she specifically talks on gifted children and the emotional side of things and how to deal with it. So we had her there. We had the gifted schools there. We had SEMAS there, which is an abacus-based mathematics system. Um, and we had Experi Buddies there, which is a phenomenal of teaching young kids about science principles in a way that they'll never ever forget it and that it's fun. 
Um, so we had them there as well. And the one thing that, that came from this event was that that was in October and the Experia Buddies and the Gifted Schools made contact and from January this year, the Experia Buddies has actually been incorporated into their curriculum um, as an optional, option, optional course that the kids can take. So that collaboration also worked very well. But the most amazing thing with this, and I actually still get goosebumps when I think about it, because it was just, it was one of those things just, that just kind of happened. Two weeks before the event. Now, one of the things that we had in our PR strategy was to say that your big corporate companies, they've all got some kind of social responsibility. They all have to get out into the communities. Most of them have also got some kind of bursary and scholarship programs. So let's see how we can hook up with them so that when they do identify sharp kids, we can actually fast track them, we can have them tested, we can get them into the right schools, into the right programs, into the right mentors, um, get the right emotional development going. We can, we can help it. Um, that's something that some of our members would be really keen to get involved in, especially some of the parents. Um, so that, that hadn't really taken off. And two weeks before this event, we get a phone call from one of our local TV stations saying that, oh, we hear you've got this event coming up. Um, would you mind if we come and film? Because we're doing a six episode series on gifted children in South Africa and the opportunities and resources that are available and what to do with them once you found them. So it, it, was, it, it was just phenomenal. It's just one of those things that just literally came together. So they came, they filmed, they interviewed a few people, um, and they included some of that footage in the series, which of course uh, brought about a lot more um, presence in the media. And I'm so convinced that that's the thing that also caused that Nelson Mandela uh, Foundation to follow us, because they've also got the Children's Fund, and they're very active in that. And there was a lot of publicity around this, especially because the series was done mostly in rural areas, so they really went out and looked for these kids. But also, about a month after the event, they contacted us with the first six kids that they'd identified that they wanted tested. So it's really just no good for them. Right, and then of course, most importantly, after all of this, we now have happy members. <laughs> <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Some of them have aged slightly. <laughs> I think that was the crying guy. All right, but we do now have a, a community that tends to be more active. Um, they might not look more happy because I've got more things to talk about, so they've also got more things to discuss and more things to argue about. But there definitely is a lot of energy coming into the organization. We're seeing a lot of people willingly volunteering for stuff, putting their names up to do stuff, asking to participate in stuff and organize things, which is also really good. Uh, right, now for me, it's never about one thing. It's, it's, it can't just be one thing. There's not one silver bullet that does it all. It's really the synergy and everything working together. Um, and I think the biggest challenge is to keep the momentum going and keep up to date with all of the technologies as they evolve and as they change and to evolve with them. But it's really the networking and, the, and everything working together. Because the other thing that we also have to remember is that we're sitting with a massively diverse uh, membership community and again every person likes to be communicated in communicated to in a different way. I know from a business perspective I've got some clients who like Google Talk and some who like Blackberry Messenger and some who like email and some who like SMS. So I know which ones to talk to in what manner to get answers quickly. And it's the same with our membership community. It's not about the granules and the sugar and the milk and the hot water. It's the coffee. It's the magic. So what does the future hold? Firstly, like I said, we need to keep the momentum going. We have to keep up to date with new technologies as they evolve and carry on. And keep being sensitive to what the members want and give them the opportunity to actually tell us what that is so that we can do something about it. Um, the biggest project right now, uh, for the next six months, whoops, that's the laser pointer. That's the screen move thingy. Um, this is something that um, is already developed, it's ready to be deployed, but we're holding back because we're currently busy with membership renewals, so we'll probably launch this at our annual event uh, this year. Um, this is an online membership management database, so what it means is, currently is that currently people can go onto the website, they can fill out a form to satisfy the details of change, go through to the administrator, she then captures it on the database, so it's a very tedious manual process. This system allows people to log in from anywhere, it's hosted in the cloud. 
um, and they can maintain their own details, they can subscribe to different regions newsletters within South Africa because I'm a Jovic member but I might want to see what's going on in Bloemfontein because they are growing membership um, and at some point I might want to can that subscription so they can do all of that themselves and no longer, they will no longer have to ask for someone to go and set that up for them. Um, my mentor mobile. Uh, same thing, same system, they can log in with any mobile device, it, it's not device dependent, it's also a hosted application, so um, the nice thing about that is if you make any changes, as you get feedback from members and they want more functionality, you can add it, deploy it, and it's immediately available for them on their PCs and on mobile, so I'm very excited about launching that towards the end of the year. And then of course the adminsa.org.za, uh, we've got those, the, the access to use those email addresses. We haven't implemented it yet. Our members, we've always encouraged to use the uh, vanity address that they can get on the international site. But the thing with that is that, as you know, when email comes back, it comes back into the normal email addresses. So it's, it's not as neat as having a pure means email address. So we've opened this up for members as well, which we'll tell them about in September, and they can then apply for a mentor.org.za email address, which of course also helps retain members because the membership fee is not very high. But if you're going to start using your mentor.org.za email address, even for nothing else, you might want to maintain your membership um, so that you don't lose that email functionality, and a lot of people actually value a mentor email address. So we're hoping that will work. Um, also, this, they can link this to the Yahoo account if they've got a Yahoo account, which gives them more flexibility to maintain their own policies in their account. Right, any questions? Yes, yes. Yeah, my question was, I didn't really understand how your news pay, uh, uh, the, the page with yes. news is updated. Okay, that comes through from um, Google. I'll, I'll show you on that piece if you've got internet connectivity. So your Google News, you can set certain rules and certain filters, and then from that you can get an RSS feed, and that RSS feed we've put into a tool, so it literally checks all the time whenever anything is published anywhere on the web, um, and it takes that and puts it into an RSS feed which then feeds through to the website. So it's, it's pure Google tools. And it's, it's available only to members? No, no, it's that public. one is public. Yeah. And uh, what happens if any, any uh, mm. website put something in the members only uh, pages, then it's unavailable. unavailable. It's unavailable. If you can't find it on a Google search, you won't find it. Do you use any uh, workflow tools for, you know, since you want to post the same information to you know, tweet and then throw it to Facebook or on the web page? How do you handle it? At this stage, no, we don't, we're not using any, any specific workflow. At this stage, the community actually placing those posts is limited to myself and the, the regional chains. Um, and one or two of them have got uh, regional PR people as well, marketing people. So it's, a very, it's about five or six people that typically use it. So um, we usually just coordinate amongst ourselves. Not the neatest model, I agree. Workflow is definitely the way to go. But um, at this stage, that's what we do. Yeah, Cynthia. Uh, one comment to what he was asking. There is a website as there are different named Deliberate, D L V R dot I T, and uh, you can link several accounts from Twitter to Facebook and uh, Air as as for example your blog. So whatever comes to one of one side of your system goes out in the others, and uh, you can also track community builders on Twitter. So there are certain rules that any message chapter can very easily adapt for them. So the different people can actually use general Twitter accounts uh, that a message chapter can, can have. Uh, I would suggest that you give that uh, especially to your officers. And if you give it to general members uh, that you have some sort of, uh, well, in Mexico, there's some type of, some type of contract that allows you, well, we are legally uh, associated, uh, I mean, we're recognized by Mexico, the country, as an organization, so if anyone would misuse or uh, steal our account, we can sue them. So that's actually something to think of. Yeah, that's really good. Nice. I think that's key, because they all are, even from Twitter, you can feed through to Facebook and LinkedIn at the same time, but I think that the key is to pick one. Um, whether it's deliberate, which sounds like a very good tool, or one of them, but to, to be consistent. Because currently what we do is, 
one guy is very keen on Twitter, so he'll Twitter something as Mensa Zeta, and then he'll retweet it as in his own personal capacity. Um, I like LinkedIn, so I'll go and announce it on LinkedIn, and another chairman will go and put the same message on Facebook, and, and it's not the most streamlined way to work. Cool. Yes, uh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, how how could, could we condense this into a brief piece of advice for, for new countries that are sort of emerging? Oh, that's actually, that's a very good idea. It's, how it, how it, would won't advise them to? it won't be hard to condense this and, and make it in a format that can be emailed, um, you know, with basic information and then they can always collaborate with them to ask questions. But are you looking more for, for kind of instructions on... on no, more like, uh, do, do you think that it should be a high priority for some for a new Mensa group somewhere yes. to as soon as possible establish yes. a, a presence in social networks? Definitely. Okay. I think so. That's my personal opinion. In the times we live in, um, you know, it's it's like any business. If, if you don't have that stuff in place, you're just not going to take off at the same speed. Maybe you don't want to. <laughs> Vicky? Um, do you have trouble with trolls on your sites? Like, do you moderate more? Do you know what, the, the blog really hasn't been active enough to, to attract those. Um, and the groups, like the Yahoo groups and those are all closed groups. So we, we, haven't, we haven't really had any of that. Because Men's Canada we have on LinkedIn and Facebook have had particularly one particular offender that was posted with the Axiom posts which started the war amongst all the people trying to fight the troll yeah. <laughs> instead of just you know, starve the troll. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a problem if you've got them inside of your community. We actually did have a guy on the on the fan page that was a bit abusive, and he disappeared. I don't know what happened. He's not there anymore. But um, we, we haven't had really had any major trouble. Like you. <laughs> yeah. But it is a small community, so yeah. We have a young men's media group site, you know, that's maintained by one person with uh, access by maybe four people who can post things on it, you know, and uh, then I'm wondering, do we have a Facebook? I think if we could open up a Facebook page, right, for free. Yeah. You know, with the Google uh, site, is that, is that, do you have to pay every month, or how does that work? No, Google, it depends on what kind of services you use. Most of their things are free. Um, why I really like Google is firstly they're all the biggest search engine. We see it on the statistics of people coming through to our website as well. Most of them coming through Google. Um, they found us in Google search. And what I also like about Google is that they've got open API, which means that if you've got another system and you need to connect with anything in Google, which is freely available, you can do so very easily. Um, it, it takes a very basic development to make that happen. And things like your Google Calendar is, is a free account. Um, your Google News Feeds are freely available. So all of the, we, we've not got one thing on the website that we pay for. We do have Google AdWords, which is a subscription and you choose how much you want to spend. Um, but that is simply to get advertisements uh, on their website when people search for something. And we've got a very low one because we haven't really focused on, on getting ourselves out there. Um, we really focused more on getting our house in order for our members so that we can retain our current members and, and grow the membership from there. But in terms of the Google site, and it's really straightforward to set up. I think the challenge is if you don't have someone who can help you with that um, from a technical perspective, you know, you might want to look at getting someone in place, appointing someone or recruiting someone from the membership to specifically look at getting all those things in place. Once they're in place, they pretty much run themselves. You need a, to keep an eye on it, but they really do run themselves. Sorry, if that changes the name, stand up. Oh, my question is certainly for you and your uh, problem fan and the, the, the Canadian troll. Uh, how did they affect momentum? <laughs> did, did, they, did, they, did you notice that they affected momentum on the site? Ours didn't. Um, ours didn't really. Um, I did see some of, I think it, it was one of the international groups so before we had all of this stuff going. We, we, I actually thought at one stage, wow, this, these people are really going on a lot about nothing. Um, and I guess, I guess the view sometimes is, is the only bad publicity is no publicity. So I think a lot of those things are just let go. But I think in terms of the blogs, um, people tend to respond to things that, that kind of trigger some emotion. So whether it be positive or negative, they can still choose to respond to things or not. So sometimes 
the bad things, the instigators, the catalysts, are not necessarily um, bad. Sometimes a lot of good comes out of it. Sometimes you get membership that actually kind of kill it um, if it gets out of hand. I don't know what your experience has been. You seem to have had more only people. I think someone went off his meds or something. Oh my word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was posting just really rude, offensive, um, insulting, but then he stopped because you think maybe he's back on meds or whatever. <laughs> but then the people that were offended by him, they oh, took over and then they got obnoxious by keeping him on. And then yeah. as a moderator, they're telling you that you have to delete their messages and all that stuff. You're saying, hey, 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 I'm. Um, Censorship here, so they can piss off a lot of people. Yeah, oh, I want to quit if you're going to let those messages mm -hmm. go through. So it's one of those typical events and things where no one can agree. Yeah. Or I did have one. I did have one. In, one case on LinkedIn where someone posted something, and I also got a request to remove it as inappropriate. And I actually emailed the guy. I said to him, "Look, this is the response we got. The message that you posted was interpreted as this." And he emailed back saying, "Oh shit, sorry, that's not at all what it means." And he reposted the message. So that was very positive. Um, so do you hire out uh, the groups that may want to use your particular services <laughs> help us all and get on the same page? Uh, look, I'm, I'm happy to advise in, in any way I can, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you can do on it. Because I'm a techie, I actually implemented the website myself, and I actually oh, wrote yeah. the online database myself, so I'm, I'm a little sure. It's easy for me to do things quickly because I can do it myself. But in terms of, of the whole social media and how it all fits together, that's kind of what I do in business as well. So I'm happy to to give you advice wherever I can. So was it your members that mainly got all of this ready? I mean, like the, the LinkedIn connection and some of the Facebook page and things like that. It was mainly different members. I, you did the website, but yeah, others um, did. Others did the, like the Facebook page and the, and the group. I did the LinkedIn and the Twitter, as well, but that's just creating an account. That's not really, oh, yeah. that's, that's not really right. The, the real work was really the website. And then, of course, the online database. And then only the members of your group can, can log into some of these things, like Twitter or, you know. Um, everyone, the, the Twitter is, the feeds are public, so anyone can follow us on Twitter. Okay. Um, the, the only ones that can post are the committee members because they're the only ones who've got the username and the password. You actually get a, a tool called Code Tweet where people can log in with their own uh, Twitter account and they can tweet and it's very nice in terms of keeping statistics. So you can see who tweeted what and how many times it was retweeted and everything. But, but in terms of people who are allowed to tweet, it's, it's only the committee members. Okay. But anyone can follow. Okay. Is that your question as well? Yes, because we have troubles. We have some kind of that media mm -hmm. on our forum uh, open to uh, everybody, to the public. And very often there are people from outside of Mensa who put some questions or comments that comments that are provocative. And if we allow many people to respond, then there is a mess. Yeah. So we limited it only to two of us who are responding. And I personally take a day when we have some such questions, provocative to just think of the reply and to avoid replying to the provocation. Yes. So, because that's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Because especially in Twitter, I mean, anyone can hashtag you in anything they say mm -hmm. uh, and, and it will come through. So that is quite risky. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. Uh, one is, with your closed groups, how do you verify that everyone's a member? And you're doing it yourself, so it might be manageable that way, but if you have multiple different people that are supporting the platform, Fortunately, I'm not the one actually um, moderating that, thank goodness. We've got an admin person doing that, because I'd suck at it. <laughs> um, but she's very good, she's very diligent. So what she does is typically the membership is quite easy because it's renewed every year on the same day. It's not when you join the year from then. Um, so it makes it very easy. So there's, there's a year-end process, and one of the activities includes um, all the, taking the reports of all the members who didn't renew because it'll only be them and removing them physically from the Facebook group and the LinkedIn group. Uh, we also give them a grace period of three months and email them, well she does all of that, um, email them and, and tell them that they're going to lose their access and everything else. So it's also an incentive for them to renew and everything. Uh, and my second question would be with all the events that you posted on the calendar, 
we consider it as those are public posts. Uh, it's not very easy to obscure people's addresses or that sort of information. They don't want that in public. How do you balance that need for privacy with the need to get it out to members and even potential members? Okay. Um, the events are typically held somewhere where it is public. Um, and they, they would be published on our website anyway. So the, the member's personal um, address details and things, that doesn't come through unless someone is hosting a very public event at their house and they choose to put their address in. But typically it will be where our annual, uh, our monthly meetings are held and that kind of thing. So the, the events are quite public, so we haven't had any issues with that. Um, if you do have something like, for instance, the committee meetings are not published on the, um, they've got a separate group and they run completely separately out of all of this. So, you know, the public doesn't need to know when the committee meet, meets twice a year kind of thing. So that is maintained separately. Anyone else? Oh, thank you. you will I be an honorary uh, mentor of South Africa? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> when are you coming? Is your ticket booked? <laughs> Anyone else? Great. Oh, sorry. Mm. sorry. Sorry to interrupt for the last minute. <laughs> uh, one thing that I, I kept in my head. Men's International has rules and requirements for all national groups. Um, and they have been largely intact for quite some time. One of them is that all groups have to have a, a newsletter mm -hmm. that has to be published at least six times a year. It is completely silent on all matters electronic, as far as yeah, I know. Absolutely. Maybe that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, these rules sort of also provide like a path for growing groups to That's know true. what should they build and in what order yeah. before they become mature, so to speak. Um, should it be sort of requested or, or uh, advised and in what precisely of all this? Mm. In what form? I think I think there is definitely merit in, in having some kind of boundaries, but I, I would guess that that would be restricted to things like um, you have to say on your blogs and on your Facebook and on all of those um, platforms that the views expressed are not reflective of Mensa International or the National Mensa. It's reflective of the members that actually um, interact on that because that's quite a big thing. Anyone can say anything, um, and that should not be interpreted as the view or the expression of Mensa. Um, so those kind of rules, I think you could put up. Um, it's it is hard because I mean national Mensas all have their own branding which fall within the international rules, but but they are quite these up. It's a very good point. I think this is definitely something that could be looked at, especially if we're going to encourage. Um, up and coming men's organizations to go this route. Does that answer your question? I don't know if it does. We can discuss it later. Okay. It's a big <laughs> it inspires another since there are so many nations present. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, the American branding of web presences is, is fairly universal, from as, as, as different as they all are, they're very the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the websites very, are very similar in their, in their, in their look. If, there, if, Amer if International Mensa had a Mensa, say a Mensa space, a Mensa MySpace, and, and all, there were certain web tools that every single group used to create pages that were very similar and very uniform, do you think that would help or hurt the individual countries? Um, how different are the tastes? Um. I, I like the idea that, that different countries get to do their own thing to an extent. So there's, there's an international universal flavor, but it's localized. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. The one is just that there is a big difference between different countries and their cultures. Um, so certain cultures just behave differently and respond differently to different things. The other one is, is the practicality of it. Um, because that means that if anything is rolled out internationally, it would have to kind of flow through uh, to each and every local, um, national Mensa, which takes time. Um, so, and, and also the, restricted, the restrictiveness um, of it and, and being prescribed in terms of what kind of tools you can use. And, and it, I mean, it's, you know, next week or the week thereafter, you might see phenomenally new tools 
you now get even that online membership database was written in a in a very rapid development uh, model driven development tool where you literally build pictures before you can build an entire system in 20 minutes. Um, so to not be able to use that, um, I, I think would be very restrictive. Yes, I would just like to address that. That um, that's international has very few, actually very few criteria for national mensas, and I think it's best that we stay at sort of at arm's length from each one of them, because otherwise to dictate some way some standardization other than the the, the various criteria that are there now. I, I think we would have to leave all on our hands. Uh, we, for instance, with the uh, Mensa name and logo, that's about as far as we go is, is to show to ask countries to follow that. And we, we do have on the uh, Mensa.org website, we have the various ways you can use that name and logo. You have to do that. That's that's a rule. But but as far as like deciding or uh, any one of the Mensa uh, elected officers deciding what tools to use to build websites or what, what they should look like, I, I think it, 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 uh, it would um, dilute the effect of the individual website or the individual culture, country, or language. Uh, I would like each website to have a, uh, a little icon that says translated into English. They don't all have that. <laughs> and I'm not multilingual, so I would really like to see that on all of them. But know, overall, I think that we need to retain the flavor and the character of the individual country and only require certain legal things that they must do. Yeah, and I must say, um, Mint International has been very responsive in terms of we need to integrate to things in the website, have information updated. Even when we like, went live with ours, the URL for the contact us page changed and Within, I think, an hour of sending the email to ask for it to be changed, it's changed. So that, that's really that's that, that quite good. Good. Yes. Um, I understand all your content is provided to volunteers. Is, is that correct? You don't have anyone uh, from the paid staff from your office doing that content-wise. Nothing. Would you tell us the secret how to motivate those volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> because we have a hard time. Um, getting someone putting uh, on a regular basis new items on the website or the blog or whatever. I mean, now we're lucky we have two or three uh, ladies who uh, put things on the Facebook page but, but not on the website. So is, is there, is, do you think it's, it's a matter of, of luck or if you have some sort of uh, incentive to them or, or what's, what's, the, what's uh, the reason why they do that? I They're lucky to have these, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's, um, I, I really do very little other than, than having put some of the stuff in place. I, I, I'm one of those people who likes to start things in the hand drive and then start the next thing. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I guess we've really just been lucky um, to have a lot of South Africans who are being very. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, it's, no, we just really have been really lucky. I mean, there's a big piece, a big couple of pages, for instance, on gifted children and resources and all of that, who is all done by our national testing psychologist. Um, and she specializes in, in working with gifted children. And we've just, I think we've just really been lucky in terms of people um, giving us stuff. And, and also maintaining, our, our teams are quite good with that. And what, what I did see happening was that it was slow in the uptake, but when the first chairman started, regional chairman started posting stuff themselves on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, it was almost like a little bit of competitiveness and the others didn't want to stay behind, so that kind of also snowballed and helped in the meeting. Please. I, I wanted to suggest a theory besides lucky. <laughs> uh, in Minsa, Mexico, a uh, long time ago, I well, we installed a small blog and eventually we, well, I uh, cleared the way to integrate this with Twitter, Facebook, etc. And when that happened, the people who rarely published and saw that uh, their work was everywhere suddenly, uh, they sort of were rewarded for their small minutes. They, they dedicated to that. So it's like a feedback. I see they have so many ways to communicate that I think well, they may be lucky, 
but also the fact that uh, the members think that whatever they, they write will be read and can be commented, it, it's actually good. We have one former member, when I, when I installed the blog, uh, at, at some point I thought it should be free for outsiders to post as long as I could review it first. And I have one person who is no longer a member, but he is the most frequent blogger <laughs> that I have. <laughs> so he likes to be uh, answered. That is, that is it. That's amazing. Well, any other questions? Well, thank you very much.